All right. Well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to come speak with you today. To hear my colleagues and I tell you about the future of scientific research. And just to start off today, I'm going to tell you about something I'm really passionate about, which is the future of personal genomics. So just to begin, if you guys could do me a favor and raise your hand if you know what we're looking at on the screen here today. All right. So if you were thinking to yourself, the human genome, then you are 100% correct. And in fact, if this were a pop quiz, I would have given you credit for an answer such as a bunch of chromosomes, because that's what this is, and I would have given you extra credit if you'd said a male's genome. Because as you can see, each of the chromosomes up here on the screen has a pair, has a buddy. Except for if you look in the top center, you'll see a kind of teeny tiny little grayish blue chromosome. That's the Y chromosome. Now, scan your eyes to the right, and you'll see a much larger red chromosome all by itself. That's the X chromosome. So this person is XY, male. Two red chromosomes would have indicated XX, or female. So once again, if you guys could raise your hand for me if you have had your entire genome sequenced. Okay, now, if you could do me one last favor and raise your hand if you have thought about quite a bit and made a decision about whether or not you'd like to have your entire genome sequenced. Okay. Well, what I'm here to talk to you about today is why I think it's really important that every person have the knowledge necessary to make that decision. Because I think it's one you're going to face sooner than you think. And to spark that discussion, today I'm going to tell you some stories about myself and others that I hope gives you an idea about the current state and the future potential of personal genomics, which is really all about understanding all the ins and outs of this beauty up here on the screen, the human genome, which is comprised of 23 pairs of chromosomes. And if we look a lot closer, if we zoom in, we see that these chromosomes are, in fact, a double helix, and they're made up of these building blocks, A, C, T, and G. And these building blocks are called base pairs. So how many of these base pairs are there in the human genome? How many would we have to sequence? A whopping three billion. And just to give you some perspective on that, that would fill 200 1,000-page New York City telephone directories. Now I realize, as you all came in, I noticed that the majority of this audience was probably born in the late 90s, so you probably have not needed nor seen a telephone directory. But you get the idea. This is something we don't want to be printing out and leafing through. Now, a portion of your base pairs are organized into about 25,000 genes. And genes are just a sequence of these base pairs all strung together, and that sequence codes for a protein with a really specific and defined function in your body. And so you have genes for your hair color, for your eye color. In reality, genes, they code for every part of you. And a change in your sequence from A to a C or a T to a G can result in the production in a different or a defective protein. And that can lead to diseases such as cancer. Now, I know it's dark, but if you could look around, you would notice that we're all really different and unique. And that might make us think that our genomes are also really different. And that's where we'd be wrong. In fact, people's genomes don't differ from each other very much at all, and I've always found that really fascinating. Each person's genome differs by about 0.1% or 1 in 1,000 base pairs. But these really small differences have really profound effects. And, and so understanding and having knowledge of genes at the sequence level is really important. And this was kind of the impetus behind the really famous Human Genome Project, which had as its primary goal to sequence the entire human genome and to then use that information to better understand the function of the genome and its role in health and disease. The first genome was actually a compilation of many people's DNA. It was a project that was started in the late 80s, took about 13 years to complete, and $3 billion. So it's safe to assume if it still took that much time and that much money to sequence a genome, this really wouldn't be a decision we'd be grappling with today because I don't think very many people would be able to have their genome sequenced. But what's remarkable is that the speed of DNA sequencing is increasing at an incredible rate. What used to take 13 years to do can now be done in a matter of days or hours. And this is entirely due to the vast and rapid increase in DNA sequencing technology. Today, genomes are actually sequenced on fairly large machines about the size of an oven, but the size of these sequencers is dramatically decreasing, and a recent development is a teeny tiny little DNA sequencer that can fit in the palm of your hand and has on one end of it a USB port that can be plugged directly into your computer. Now today, presently, a little guy this size can't quite handle a genome the size of a human's. However, looking at the slope of this line, it's not hard to imagine that in the future, a flash drive like this could be able to sequence and store your entire genome, which means, ladies and gentlemen, that in the future, you may be walking around with your genome in your back pocket. Now, looking at this graph, you'll see a technology written in red near the top right called massively parallel DNA sequencing. 
This technology was just taking off when I started graduate school in 2005. It's also known as next generation sequencing. When I started graduate school, I was so excited, and I thought I was pretty cool, to be able to use this technology just once in my research. And now I use it repeatedly in the lab, only seven years later, it's become old hat. So presently today, you can sequence your genome very quickly. However, that $3 billion price tag is still really high. But what's amazing is that the cost of DNA sequencing is also dramatically dropping. Here in blue, you'll see a corollary to Moore's law which is just this idea that computing power doubles every 18 months to about two years. And that has been an industry standard for a good pace in technological advancement for quite some time. And what you'll notice is that the cost of DNA sequencing, the exponential drop, is just beating it out by leaps and bounds. It's just kicking its butt. And I remember in one of my first classes in graduate school, sitting there and having my professor tell me about this really exciting race to the $1,000 genome to be the first one to sequence a genome for 1000 bucks. Today, presently, and actually just recently, that has become a reality. So you can sequence your genome quickly, and you can sequence it cheaply. But what does this mean? What does our genome tell you? So many, many things in truth, and much of it we're still learning about through active research daily. But in my mind, there are at least three categories that we can learn about. We can learn descriptive information, information about our traits and our ancestry. We can learn diagnostic information, information about our health risks and conditions we may presently have. And we can also learn about preventative information, actionable information about the health of us or our children. So what's this first one look like? Descriptive information. Here's an example based on just a portion of my genome, not even the entire thing, that says that my ancestry is largely European, centered in the north. Not that interesting or not that surprising looking at me. However, pretty cool you can tell that from just my DNA. So what about diagnostic information? What does that look like in real life? There was recently an article published about a young woman named Lily Grossman. And she's been afflicted since she was a very young child with a mysterious form of muscle weakness. It makes it hard for her to walk and talk. And in fact, at night, she's woken up continually by tremors that keep her up. So in an effort to better understand her illness, she had her entire genome sequenced at the Scripps Institute. And through that, by looking at her DNA, scientists and her doctor were able to tell that she had mutations in two different genes. Now, there are documented cases of whole genome sequencing revealing the genetic cause of an illness and that leading to an immediate successful treatment plan. However, in the case of Lily, while they now knew what was causing her illness, doctors still don't know everything about these genes or at least enough about these genes to give her a drug that's going to give her an immediate cure. But knowing that these genes are the cause of her illness and actually the reduction in the cost of sequencing allowed other patients to have their DNA sequenced and they have found other examples of where similar mutations cause the same symptoms. So putting all this information together, it gives scientists better direction in how to try and research to find a cure for Lily and others. Now I chose to tell this story about Lily today because I think it makes a really good point. And that is that even if we can sequence your genome, even if we can tell you and read to you every base pair of your DNA, it doesn't mean we understand all the information encoded in it. So the future of personal genomics, a huge part of that research, is going to be the functional studies necessary to understand what all of your genes do and how all the different mutations in them affect you and your health. In fact, for my postdoctoral work at Stanford, the field that I'm studying is called RNA editing, which actually looks at sequence changes in your RNA instead of your DNA. And the advent of this technology I talked about earlier, this massively parallel DNA sequencing technology or next generation sequencing, has allowed us to find thousands of examples of these, these pace pair changes in our RNA. But we really only understand right now how a handful of them work. So a big part of the future of the, of the field that I study and what a lot of the researchers in my field are gonna work on is understanding how these changes in our RNA affect us and our health. So what about this last, this last question, preventative information? What, what kind of preventative information can we find out? Presently, a pregnant woman can determine if her child's risk of a trisomy, and a trisomy is when you have three copies instead of two of a chromosome. So Down syndrome is caused by three copies of chromosome 21. And presently, one of the more common ways for a woman to find out her child's risk of a trisomy is through fairly invasive techniques such as amniocentesis. And that involves inserting a large needle into the woman's abdomen to extract the amniotic fluid around her baby and then to take that fluid to look at her baby's DNA and to look at chromosome copy number. Now, while these techniques are certainly safe and they are very accurate, they do carry with them a small but measurable chance of miscarriage. 
And so there's a new technology that's just recently been implemented called cell-free DNA. And this technology is based on the idea that when a woman is pregnant, her baby's DNA actually sheds into her bloodstream. So a pregnant woman's blood actually has both her and her baby's DNA in it. So by simply taking a sample of a pregnant woman's blood, you can then extract the baby's DNA and analyze that for chromosome copy number. You can ask whether the risks of her baby's chance of having Down syndrome, three copies of chromosome 21, Edwards syndrome, three copies of chromosome 18, or Patel syndrome, three copies of chromosome 13, just by taking a sample of her blood. And in fact, this technology can be used for and has been used for sequencing an entire fetal genome, so being able to sequence an entire baby's genome, which means that mothers, fairly early on in their pregnancy, by simply taking a blood sample, can get a huge amount of information about their baby's health and their genome. So I just want to end today by telling you a little bit of a story about how personal genomics has affected me and my health. So not long ago, I sent off my spit to 23andMe, which I don't know if anybody else has done that, but it's actually kind of a lot of spit. But you send it off, and they take your spit and they extract your DNA. And from that, they can look at your sequences and give you some information about yourself. And what I found out is that I actually have an increased sensitivity for a commonly used blood that are called warfarin. And in January of 2010, the FDA actually updated warfarin's label to say that physicians can use the genomic variants or the sequences of patients' DNA to determine a better initial dose for a patient when it comes to this blood thinner. And so actually, recently, my great uncle went into the hospital and they gave him what's considered a normal dose of warfarin, and he reacted poorly to it. And this could be because we share the same genetic background. So what's really cool about this is that I could go into the doctor, and if they want to give me a blood thinner, I can tell them about my genetic background, and it can help them to better treat me. And this type of thing is just going to happen more and more often throughout your lifetime. It may not be through 23andMe because you may have heard about their troubles with the FDA, but it is certainly a space that will be filled. And in fact, another kind of interesting story about 23andMe, when my friend got her results back, she found out that she had a mutation in a gene called CCR5, and this mutation in this gene makes her resistant to HIV. She can't get HIV. It's actually a mutation that's commonly found in the Western European, or more commonly found in Western European background. And what's really cool about this is there's a company in the Bay Area that has taken this knowledge that we now know about this mutation in this gene, and they've coupled it with this really new technology that is just exploding in the genomics field right now. If you look in the literature right now in the genomics field, this technology is everywhere, and it's called genome editing. And what it allows is for researchers to make a specific mutation in a specific gene in live cells. And so they're taking this technology, and they're working on using it to cure people of HIV. And this is something in clinical trials. So this is really cool, because this means we will not only be able to read your DNA, but in the future we may be able to edit it for your benefit. So I've told you today about many advances in both the science and the technology that's allowing personal genomics to become a reality for you, that's allowing you to access more and more information about your genome. So what I think everyone needs to start thinking about is what they're going to say when their doctor asks, because I think they will, do you want your genome sequenced? I think that the future of personal genomics is more information, more quickly, more cheaply. So I would urge all of you to brace yourselves. Because personal genomics is coming. And with it, you're going to be able to get really cool information about your traits and your ancestry, really useful information about drug sensitivities. But you also could get scary or upsetting information about whether or not you're predisposed to a disease such as breast cancer or Alzheimer's. So everybody needs to start educating themselves about what their genetics can tell them, how it can tell them, and what they want to know and when. Thank you.